May 2nd, 1999. In a small Texas town, police mark off one of the worst crime scenes in local memory. A minister and his wife bludgeoned to death in bed. The brutality of the crime was something that you only hear about in horror shows. Before long, a man who rides the rails to find his victims lands on the FBI's 10 most wanted list. Fear spreads in one of America's largest manhunts. I believe everybody was scared, you know, especially if they live next to railroad tracks. It was a killer on the run, thumbing his nose at law enforcement and continuing to kill. Along with police, there are those who chronicle the investigation up close, on film, on paper, and on tape. They are the public's first witness. Through their lens, they capture our darkest chapters of crime. By all appearances, West University Place, Texas, is a quiet community nestled in the Houston area. The tree-lined streets provide a sanctuary from the bustle of the big city. West University Place has a population, by and large, upper middle class uh, to upper class people. People like to move into there, especially people who want to live in a city and have city atmosphere, but yet their little neighborhood gives them a sense of a community. The crime problem there is essentially very low. December 16th, 1998. Dr. Claudia Benton is a well-known physician devoted to her work. She lives in a home near the railway tracks with her husband and two daughters. Houston is a, a center in the world for medical research, and she was one of the leading researchers in, in the community. She was a very well-liked lady, quite a professional. In the evening hours, uh, Dr. Benton was uh, saying goodbye to her husband and two daughters who were on their way to Arizona to visit family before the Christmas holidays. Dr. Benton is soon alone in the house. With a presentation to deliver the next morning, she works late in her upstairs bedroom. Uh, it appears that she had been watching TV and working on uh, her laptop computer, that she may have just uh, gradually fallen asleep, say sometime before midnight. December 17th, morning. Dr. Benton fails to show up for her presentation. Friends and colleagues grow concerned. Several of her co-workers had called the police department wanting us to go by the house to do a welfare check. No one was able to get in touch with her all day long. That afternoon, local officers entered the home. There are signs of a break-in and rooms are in a state of disarray. Upstairs, they find Dr. Benton dead beneath a blood-stained blanket. A butcher knife sits nearby. And it was a gruesome uh, crime scene. My initial thoughts, it was overkill. It was very, very violent. I went through the house uh, to view everything. I had a scared feeling. I knew that the other officers had been through that house, but I, myself, went through and looked in every closet and every crack and crevice to make sure that the person uh, who may have done this was not still there. I had never been involved uh, with the case of this magnitude. It was clear to them that this was a very, very heinous crime and it was going to be pretty difficult to try and solve. Forensic experts from the Houston Police Department arrive to help process the scene. So we photographed the outside of the house, 
and then we work our way in and then we just work our way toward where the actual uh, victim is lying and we we'll photograph everything. When you get to a crime scene, you don't, don't, don't disturb anything. You try to photograph everything as it is. And then when the medical examiner starts taking the blankets off, then you start taking photographs as you're basically removing layers. Dr. Benton is found to have multiple stab wounds in her back and hands, as well as fractures in her skull. The latter inflicted by a bronze statuette found lying on the floor. She has also been sexually assaulted. What they saw was devastating that uh, a person could be treated in such a way. Whoever killed her had a lot of rage. You know, so many murders, it's generally domestic. It's very rarely a stranger crime. And it became pretty clear from the beginning that this was going to be a stranger crime. We just realized that this, you know, this is suddenly differently, that's very dangerous. And he was possibly some type of serial murderer just by, the, you know, what was in the crime scene. The proximity of the railway tracks is also noted. There was probably four or five trains that came by being 40 to 50 yards away from the railroad tracks. I was thinking to myself, how convenient it would be to wait for a train to come by and get into a house. To be able to walk in the house, walk upstairs, and absolutely not be heard because of all the train noise. That evening, police break the tragic news to Dr. Benton's husband, now in Arizona with the couple's two children. Talking to him initially was, uh, was very difficult. I tried to put myself in his position if I was getting a call about my spouse uh, possibly being uh, brutally murdered. It was just, it was utter shock. At the same time, news of the killing spreads, alarming local residents. The profile of the victim made it uh, an attention-getting case. Also, the kind of grisly nature of the crime. Uh, woman, home alone, attacked, sexually assaulted, murdered, um, is enough to raise that profile and get anybody's attention. Due to the sexual assault, the coroner performing the autopsy is able to secure DNA samples from the killer's semen found on Dr. Benton's body. If police can track down a suspect, they may be able to tie him directly to the crime. By the following morning, detectives begin interviewing the victim's friends and family members, searching for any information related to the crime. They also accompany Dr. Benton's husband on a walk through his home, hoping he may spot something out of the ordinary. Items are missing, including a stereo and some jewelry. He also notes that his wife's Jeep is gone. As her keys were not taken, police believe the suspect hotwired the vehicle and used it to escape. In the garage, they find a piece of broken plastic. And when we looked at it further, we realized it was the housing from the steering column from the Jeep. Uh, when I looked at the underneath of the steering column, I could see fingerprints, three beautiful, distinct fingerprints. And I knew those had to have been from the suspect. I knew that we had something to go on. The prints are lifted from the plastic and entered into databases across the country. As hoped, a match turns up, but not without some additional mystery. The fingerprints seem to belong to a shadowy figure from Mexico who has gone by at least nine known aliases in previous run-ins with the law. The most common name used is Rafael Resendez Ramirez. He is either 39 or 40 years of age. Rafael Resendez Ramirez was, was truly a, a drifter. If there's a, a definition of a drifter, he fit that bill. His favorite mode of transportation was the train, and he would catch trains in the rail yards and go wherever they took him. When Dr. Benton's missing Jeep is found abandoned next to railway tracks in San Antonio, 
police discover Resendez's fingerprints inside the vehicle as well. They now have a concrete lead. Once that match was made, then you at least had a suspect, a real firm suspect, who had no reason to be in that car. She didn't sell the car to him. She didn't loan it to him. He didn't work for her. Had no reason to be there. When I first heard uh, the, the name and that we did have uh, someone identified, I was very, very happy. The next step, though, obviously, is trying to find the guy, and I knew that would be uh, probably one of the most difficult things. It's a search that will grip the entire country when a dangerous killer strikes again. January 1999. Police in Texas investigate the brutal murder of Dr. Claudia Benton. Their prime suspect is a drifter from Mexico known as Rafael Resendez Ramirez. I was able to make a timeline of his activities uh, pieced together from all the information that was in his file. I had uh, pictures, uh, old ID cards, and so forth, and he, he made himself look so different uh, from year to year. It was quite amazing seeing uh, the transformations. Resendez's criminal record under various names includes illegal entry into the United States, as well as assault, burglary, and drug-related charges. He had a fairly extensive criminal history. He was deported, returned back to the US, charged with immigration issues, deported back and forth and back and forth. Police distribute posters throughout the state showing their suspects' various appearances. Immigration officials are notified to be on the lookout for Resendez at the Mexican border. Some officers feel that if Resendez is indeed their man, he may have slipped back into Mexico. Others fear he is still in the state and may strike a game. May 1999. Weimar, Texas. The town of 2000 sits on the railway line west of Houston, 90 miles from the Benton crime scene. Weimar has only a few full-time police officers and no crime scene unit. Weimar is a really neat, small rural town. Very friendly, very open, uh, very little crime. Uh, we have a lot of churches in Weimar, very religious community. We have great people, friendly people, willing to help one another. Uh, it's just a, just a nice town to live in. Two leaders in the quiet community are 46-year-old Norman Cernick and his wife, Karen. Reverend Cernick was the pastor of the United Church of Christ. He and his wife were very, very involved in the church, well-liked, very well-respected. Always had a smile on their face, you know, always greeting other people. May 2nd, a Sunday morning. Many Weimar residents head to their weekly worship. At the United Church of Christ, Reverend Cernick is uncharacteristically late. I think the church services start around 9.30. Congregation had gathered there and, and uh, no preacher. A greeter from the church decides to walk over to the Cernic residence, located on the same town block. He finds the door unlocked. Inside, the Reverend and his wife lie dead in their bedroom, victims of a brutal attack. The murder weapon sits nearby. They were brutally assaulted in their sleep. They had been killed with a sledgehammer that uh, had been taken from the garage of the Cernix residence. They were both hit in the head with sledgehammer. As the scene is cordoned off, word of the gruesome killing spreads in the small town, reaching Mayor Benny Kosler. So I went up to the house where the Cernix were, and then the chief was there. And I told him, I said, Chief, this is something new to both of us. Yeah, I don't ever remember of a murder in Weimar. You know, you immediately began trying to figure out, you know, who in the world could have done something like this. This had to be some kind of drifter, 
you know, no one locally done this. I said, Bill, whatever this takes, do it, get it. I said, we'll worry about the dollars later. That afternoon, Weimar police get help at the scene from a nearby sheriff's office, as well as the Texas Rangers. You know, we've collected all sorts of evidence, pieces of food that we believe he may have eaten, to evidence from the bodies, evidence in the house, fingerprints were taken all over every place, just tons and tons and tons of evidence. Those familiar with the Claudia Benton murder near Houston quickly point out similarities between the crimes. Vehicles were taken, trinkets were taken from both scenes. The murders were brutal. Uh, both occurred at residences which were very close to a railroad track. Karen Cernick has also been sexually assaulted. The autopsy provides police with a semen sample and a DNA profile of the killer. When compared to the profile from the Benton scene, forensic experts find a match. Rafael Resendez Ramirez is now a prime suspect in both crimes. Then we began to go, wow, where does this start? Where does it end? You know, we knew we had at least three homicides. How many more, we had no idea. A reward of $50,000 is now offered for any information leading to the capture of the Mexican drifter. In downtown Houston, a growing FBI team begins coordinating efforts between state and local police. We've got to try to get this solved as quickly as we possibly can before he strikes again. What we did was immediately got in touch with the chief of police up in that area and the sheriff uh, in those counties and let them know what we had down here. And we just sort of brought them in and put them on our task force. Officers begin searching his aliases and stated dates of birth for a clue into his true identity south of the border. If they can track down family members or friends, they may be one step closer to finding their suspect. At the same time, extra patrols comb the streets of Weimar, keeping a close eye on the railway tracks. Police Chief Bill Livingston tries to reassure fearful residents that another attack in the same place is unlikely. I had a, what I thought was a difficult job in that I was trying to pacify my citizens and let them know that everything was safe and they were secure. But at the same time, I had to keep up the hype on this individual. When folks hear the words serial killer, it, it becomes more to them than just a random crime. It becomes a premeditated act and everybody's a potential victim. People that had never had guns before bought guns. People that had old guns stored someplace, got them out and put bullets in. Everybody started putting bars in the windows and, and the security systems, making sure that all the doors and windows were locked. I know my wife said she didn't realize we had that many windows in the house until she started locking them. People were scared, and rightfully so. June 4th, 1999. Three miles west of Weimar, along the same stretch of railway track, a local woman pulls into a farmyard accompanied by her husband. The farm belongs to the woman's mother, Josephine Kunvitschka. Josephine Kunvitschka was a 73-year-old widow woman. I'm told she was a lady who liked to make jelly. She had grandchildren. She loved them. And her daughter and her son-in-law had gone to the house to feed the animals, check on her mother. And when she went in the bedroom, she was found dead, bludgeoned in the head. She went screaming out of the house to her husband, who's in the barn, uh, saying, mom's been killed. Just miles from the Cernic crime scene, Josephine Kunvitschka has been killed with the pickaxe. Sheriff Rick Vandal is one of the first officers to arrive. It was just a cold-blooded murder. The sense, senseless killing, just, it just tears your guts out. You're just overwhelmed. 
The daughter was devastated. I know she'll never forget what she saw when she opened that door in that bedroom. To be with her the rest of her life. Police dogs soon tracked the scent of Josephine's killer to nearby railway tracks, where the trail vanishes. They were able to determine that he spent a little time in there. He fixed him some food, uh, ate a couple plums, made him some toast. He had to be sort of an animal to, to what he'd done, and then done to, to eat in that same house. You know, just unbelievable. They were able to secure a fingerprint off of a deep freeze that was right beside the window where he came in. When the prints are examined in Houston, they confirm everyone's worst fears. Rafael Resendez Ramirez is terrorizing a small Texan community. That's when everybody, sure enough, went berserk. I felt absolutely awful. I was the one that told the people of Weimar that, you know, people don't come back and murder does not come back to the scene of the crime. You know, don't worry, everything's going to be safe. People don't do that. And then he did, almost as to taunt us. A day after Josephine Konvichka is discovered dead, another body turns up under similar circumstances, this time east of Houston. Noemi Dominguez, a 26-year-old school teacher, is found in her apartment, also situated near railway tracks. She has been clubbed to death. FBI officers also flag Resendez as the prime suspect in the killing of Christopher Meyer, a university student beaten to death two years earlier in the state of Kentucky. It just kept mushrooming and mushrooming, and they found where he was a suspect in other crimes, in other cities, in other areas. Fear spreads as the media coverage intensifies. I don't know who dubbed the name Rail Car Killer, but it stuck pretty quickly. It was the Rail Car Killer, the Rail Car Killer. Even for people who knew this guy's name, we were all saying nobody used his name. It was the Rail Car Killer. And that was the big, the big headline. With his crime spree seemingly picking up pace, Rafael Resendez Ramirez is about to become the target of one of the largest manhunts in American history. June 1999. In Houston, Texas, an FBI task force, dozens of officers strong, searches for Rafael Resendez Ramirez, a drifter from Mexico, now widely known as the rail car killer. He has brutally murdered as many as six people. Some feel he begins with plans to rob his victims, only to be overcome with sudden violent urges. It certainly seems the intent may have been, I'll just steal goods, food, and feed myself, and steal what I can, a value that I think is a value. But when somebody showed up, or if they were already there, then that other inner demon came through and he had to do something. This was his pattern of technique, is to overwhelm them immediately with blunt force so that they would not be able to defend themselves. In Weimar, home to three recent victims, the rail car killer glares from wanted posters across town. The sound of each approaching train strikes terror in local residents. Well, this area was the target of our resentments from theirs. All the people who lived along where that train track goes were afraid. They were in fear. Many of them left home to go live with their siblings somewhere or other relatives. So you just wonder, is he going to be able to kill anybody else in your county here, or anybody's for that matter? Uh, you, you want to protect them. Believing there is safety in numbers, some families near the tracks begin sleeping together in one room. People were on edge. Our call volume increased dramatically. People that heard noises or heard something in their backyard were calling. We had citizens that were armed all of a sudden. Uh, and I was afraid that for my officer's safety, if they're trying to do their job, 
uh, in somebody else's backyard and a neighbor may see them and think, my gosh, who is this? It affected me every night. Just never knew when he was going to jump off that train. Officers across southern Texas search abandoned stretches of railway tracks, looking for areas where Resendez may camp out. Homeless shelters throughout the state also come under scrutiny. People knew who to look for. They just didn't know where he was. We took, physically took, the leaflets or flyers to the border to pass those out down there so that everybody could have them, so they could help find this guy. At the FBI Command Center, investigators examine the pattern of Resendez's known movements. They believe he often rides the train eastwards along the San Antonio to Houston line, but then drives back west in cars that he steals from his victims. Hoping to catch him in transit, Operation Train Stop is initiated. In June, 100 officers search eastward bound trains as they stop briefly at a switching station. Dogs sniff out stowaways while helicopters above watch for escapees. I personally never realized how a person could hide on a train car. Yeah, I mean, it just seems to me like a big old box car. You're either sitting inside or you're not. But there's just a number of little places on there. Along another stretch of the railway, police find close to two dozen suspected illegal immigrants hiding in boxcars. Resendez, however, is not among them. We even built a platform in the back of our offices, in the back of City Hall, that uh, stood up high enough where we could look down into uh, boxcars, railcars. We felt like we had a lot better uh, vantage point from that height. Every time a train came through Weimar, one of the officers was on that platform day and night with spotlights or flashlights or whatever we had to have to check every single train. If we found somebody on the train, then we got it stopped and searched the train, got those people off the train. So we questioned those people, asked them, showed them his picture so that we could try to get any other information as to where he might be or what he might be doing. Some officers fear Resendez may have moved out of state or simply into another part of Texas. I mean, we're watching one little uh, rail that runs between Houston and San Antonio. You know, there are train tracks all over the United States. It could be anywhere. June 15th, in Gorham, Illinois, hundreds of miles to the north of Weimar, an 80-year-old man named George Morber and his daughter Caroline Frederick are found dead in a mobile home near a railway line, shot and beaten to death with a shotgun. The crime scene is exceptionally violent. Fingerprints flag Resendez. Around the same time, discouraging news for those carrying out the manhunt. Agents discover that two weeks earlier, their suspect was briefly in the custody of Border Patrol officers during one of his many illegal crossings between Mexico and the United States. At the time, immigration computers were not linked to the FBI database. Therefore, when Resendez's prints were entered into the system, immigration officials were not alerted to his status as a wanted man. Three people had been killed since. The public was justifiably outraged, and it was difficult for folks to understand how such a high-profile criminal could be caught by a law enforcement organization and then promptly released. Facing a rising body count and growing public pressure, the man leading the task force, FBI Special Agent Don Clark, pushes his Washington bureau for more resources because this was an epidemic that wasn't going to stop. And we needed to get this guy on the top 10 most wanted list, get the media involved, get the nation involved, and then we closed down avenues that this person can go freely. On June 21st, 1999, Rafael Resendez Ramirez, now a suspect in at least eight brutal murders, is added to the FBI's list of most wanted criminals alongside notorious fugitives like Osama bin Laden and Eric Robert Rudolph. Being on that list added so many more resources 
do I have the capabilities to look for this person? It also gave us the opportunity to offer a substantial reward. Well, the FBI's top 10 list is what gained the national attention and started pushing the case onto the national newscasts. We had 24 hours around the clock going, and, and, and then it got to almost a personal point. We didn't want to have to live with knowing that somebody else uh, had been killed before we got our hands on this guy. As the manhunt intensifies, investigators get their biggest lead to date. They find Rafael Resendez Ramirez's true identity. Making contact with his extended family will put them one step closer to a serial killer. June 22nd, 1999. In Texas, a task force over 100 members strong is searching for a Mexican man known as Rafael Resendez Ramirez, or the rail car killer. Now on the FBI's 10 most wanted list, police suspect him of eight murders. He shows no signs of slowing down. It was a fixture on our news. On a daily basis, every newscast, there was something about the search for him. People were here in trains every place, to include myself. They wanted us to catch this guy at all costs. Following up on one of their best leads to date, investigators trace Rafael Resendez Ramirez's true identity south of the border. According to a birth certificate found in Puebla, Mexico, he was born Angel Leoncio Reyes Resendez on August 1st, 1959. Their search takes them to the Mexican town of Rodeo. It soon appears that their suspect has been leading a double life. Residents quickly recognize the face in the FBI's wanted posters as Angel Resendez, a quiet local man with a common law wife and young child. But although he drifted, it's unusual because he frequently went back to his family and he frequently had contact with some of the family members. When investigators interview his common law wife, she claims she hasn't seen her husband in at least two weeks. She admits he often travels to the United States, but refuses to believe he is capable of violence. It was very important to us to try and get the family involved in this, to bring him in to us so that justice could be served. If you love your loved one, the best thing to do is to assist in this investigation and try to get him to turn himself in or you assist us in turning him in. Police learn that Resendez also has a half-sister in the United States. His sister was in New Mexico. The initial phone call with her was just to ask her if she had had any contact with her, uh, with her brother, if she knew where he might be. I didn't get a whole lot uh, from her at the time. Uh, what she told me is she hadn't seen him and had much contact uh, with her brother. As police keep in touch with the rail car killer's family, the intense media coverage of the manhunt brings an endless flow of information from a fearful public. Because the most important thing was to be able to have an entrance point for people to call in from any place in the country about tips that they may have. And then the second uh, is to be able to sort through these as quickly as we could. At one point, more than 1,200 calls had come in to the FBI's command center saying, I've seen him here. No, I've seen him here. I've seen him here. In Kentucky, a woman contacts police and claims she recently spoke with an Hispanic man matching Resendez's appearance. Investigators sweep through homeless shelters in the state, searching for any sign of the suspect. In Columbus, Ohio, police stop a train and search the vicinity with dogs after a witness claims to have spotted Resendez on board. We would have analysts to be able to go through these and try to sort through and prioritize these tips. Do we think that this person could have gone from here to there in the last 24 hour period that we really think that he was over to this location? Most tips come from the stretch of railway between Houston and San Antonio, where residents remain on high alert. 
police search Resendez's wife's home in Mexico and secure numerous items of jewelry given to her by her husband. Photos of the valuables are shown to family members of victims north of the border. Many identify the items as belonging to their deceased loved ones, adding further evidence against the FBI's prime suspect. By early July 1999, investigators announced that Resendez is now the prime suspect in a ninth murder, that of 87-year-old Leafy Mason, found beaten to death the previous fall in Hughes Springs, Texas. At the same time, police keep in touch with the rail car killer's family, hoping they will convince their fugitive relative to turn himself in. With the manhunt now reaching a feverish pitch, that contact starts to show promise. Resendez's half-sister begins to make overtures to police about her brother's possible surrender. Phone calls became a little bit more consistent uh, between her and the team that was talking to her, and it started to appear that she was really moving towards that point of making this happen. A Texas Ranger, accompanied by FBI agents, meets with the woman in New Mexico. The sister admits she has been in contact with Resendez, who is hiding in Mexico. Facing almost certain capture if he ever surfaces, he is willing to discuss his options. As they speak, she relays information by phone to other relatives south of the border, presumably in direct contact with Resendez himself. I think one of the most significant parts of this is that she was able to get them to understand that this was not going to go away. So you can go this way or eventually you're going to be captured one way or the other. Some feel Resendez is afraid of bounty hunters in Mexico, now motivated by a reward of $125,000. Even though he could face the death penalty in Texas, he may prefer to be captured alive rather than dead. The one promise that you could make is that if he turns himself in, we will ensure his safety and nobody's going to shoot him on the spot or something of that nature. But you have to be clear that he's going to go before the justice system and whatever happens, you know, justice will be done. The FBI were able to essentially get in with family members and convince them that it was in his best interest to turn himself in. A tentative deal is reached. According to Resendez's half-sister, one of the most wanted men in America will show up at the border early the next morning. The news spreads quickly to the FBI command center in Houston. While some are skeptical, others hope this is finally the end game of their massive manhunt. July 13th, 1999, early morning. Near El Paso, Texas, police move into place on the American side of the bridge that leads to Mexico. If Resendez actually shows up, the rail car killer may finally be in custody. If he doesn't, he will remain free, capable of killing again. July 13th, 1999, near El Paso, Texas, on the American side of a bridge linking the United States and Mexico, police agencies wait anxiously for the appearance of serial killer Rafael Resendez Ramirez. Now the target of one of the largest manhunts in American history, he has declared a willingness to finally surrender. 9 a.m., as scheduled, Resendez appears on the other side. He is accompanied by his brother. A Texas Ranger heads out to meet him, joined by the fugitive sister and the priest. The surrender itself happened right in the middle of the International Bridge, and Resendez walked across the bridge, met Texas Ranger Carter in the middle of the bridge. A killer greets the Ranger with a handshake. Seconds later, he is in handcuffs and on his way to Houston. We were waiting at the airport when he arrived here. He was taken off the plane in shackles and handcuffs and led across the tarmac. Uh, I expected to see maybe someone who was kind of beaten down, and he struck me as not the slightest bit concerned about the fact that he was in custody. 
Despite Resendez's confident attitude, news of the surrender spreads relief. One of America's largest manhunts is finally over. We held out a press conference in the middle of the afternoon, and everybody was there. And uh, there was just a flurry of questions about, you know, how did you guys do this? It was really a pretty delightful and relieving uh, environment there. It was all about the rail car killer being apprehended. So it was a, it was a great experience and, and feeling. Nowhere is that more true than in the vicinity of Weimar, Texas, a town that has been held hostage by fear. When I found out he was arrested, I was elated. Uh, you know, all of a sudden you can take a breath, you know, you can begin to relax. Uh, he hadn't been tried, he hadn't been convicted and all that, but he was in custody and people were happy about it. I remember the day that he was captured. Uh, I was sitting in my office, and I was so relieved. I uh, <clears throat> broke down. I don't mind telling you, I broke down and cried. I was so relieved. As the country learns the good news, investigators interview Resendez and secure blood, hair, and saliva samples for DNA testing. When I saw him in person, it's like most criminals that I had come in contact with, that no matter how heinous their crimes have been, when you see them sitting behind a table or with handcuffs on or whatever the case may be, you wonder, is that the guy that really did all of this? Yeah, I mean, could that little guy have done all of this? Although Resendez could face as many as nine murder charges in various districts, Authorities proceed first with the case involving Dr. Claudia Benton near Houston. A conviction in that murder alone could bring the death penalty, making further trials unnecessary. Harris County, Texas is not the place that you want to be tried for capital murder. More people have been put to death by this county than any other county in the country. May 8, 2000, in a packed courtroom, Resendez arrives to face the evidence against him. DNA science now ties him directly to the brutal murder and sexual assault of Dr. Claudia Benton. When I watched him in court, to have people relate the information that they did about how he assaulted others, and for him to sit there and show absolutely no emotion, at least none that I could see, I felt like there had to be ice water running through his veins. Faced with insurmountable proof, the legal team defending Resendez admits that their client committed the crime, as well as the other murders he has been charged with. But they claim he suffers from paranoid schizophrenia and was not sane at the time of the attacks. It was obvious from the beginning of his incarceration and interaction with attorneys that an insanity plea is what was going to transpire. That is what transpired, and the jury simply didn't buy it. After a short trial, the jury returns with a verdict. They find Resendez guilty of capital murder. He is sentenced to death by lethal injection. I think that the conviction and the sentencing brought a tremendous amount of closure to uh, the families, and relatives, and friends of all the people that he killed. Uh, I also believe that his execution will bring another bit of closure to those same individuals. Although the man known as Rafael Resendez Ramirez received the ultimate sentence, nothing can erase the pain caused by his crimes or his widespread reign of terror. The family of these people they will live for that forever. That'll stay in their hearts, minds, all their life. And to this very day, you still see people with having a light on in their backyard and what that used to not have. I never realized that where I live, I could hear a train whistle or a train going through, but now I can hear every train whistle. Or I go across a railroad track and I see a train going across 
I'm trying to look and see where would a person be hiding on that train? It's an open car. Where would they be hiding? It would just be great to know that this guy will be put away. Now, I'm sure he has family. I feel for his family. But, you know, for the things he has done, he, um, he needs to go. For me, the case won't be over, really, until the death penalty is administered. 